Previously in lectures 10 and the earlier parts of lecture 11 in our lecture series, we've been learning how to take a trigonometric function's formula, like sine and cosine, and then graph that function. In this last video for lecture 11, we want to reverse the process. If we're given the trigonometric graph, can we come up with a equation that represents that trigonometric function. Now, we've already seen, as we've been graphing these things, and also as one studies trigonometric identities, that in fact, the same graph can actually be represented by more than one trigonometric function. We saw, we had examples where we we're graphing a cosine function, but in the end, because of a phase shift, it act, the graph actually looked like a sine wave, and vice versa. We were graphing a sine, and in the end, it looked like a cosine. So, when it comes to trying to find an equation to model the graphs we're given, it turns out there are multiple solutions, but our goal is to then choose the least complicated possibility. What's the simplest equation that will give us this graph? And so what I mean by that is when you look at this first graph, right, uh, is it a sine or is it a cosine? It's hard to tell maybe at first. I, I like to first identify the midline. The midline would be the middle of our sinusoidal wave which we see right here, the midline is y equals two. This represents that there's gonna be a, a vertical shift to the graph. We get our k value is equal to two. Now looking at the, looking at the midline, does our graph, does it look like a sine or a cosine? So focusing on the y axis over here, we start on the midline, we then go up, then we return to the midline, then we go down, then we return to it. This right here is one complete uh, cycle, and there's a lot of information we get from this. So first of all, the fact that it goes up, then down, and it starts on the midline, this makes me think that this is a sine function. Yes, you could do cosine, but we want to avoid horizontal shifts as much as possible. So I'm going to base this around a sine. It's a sine that has no reflection because it starts off by increasing. It's a sine with no reflection. Our basic function is supposed to look like y equals k plus a sine of b times x minus h, like so. Uh, so we've already identified that there is a shift of some kind. So we're going to end up with y is equal to 2 plus. The next thing we want to identify is the amplitude. How far above the midline do we get? So the midline is at 2. The tip top of this thing is at 5. That's a difference of 3, which is going to give us the amplitude. So we have y equals 2 plus 3 sine of, well, then what goes inside here? The b will determine the period change, right? Uh, and so the period, which we can see on the graph, right, we went from 0 to pi. So one single period turned out to be pi. Now the relationship between the period and this coefficient b is that uh, p is equal to 2 pi over b, like so. Um, or in particular, probably a little bit easier to use, is b is equal to 2 pi over p, which tells us b is equal to 2 pi over pi. You cancel the pi's, you end up with a 2. So we're going to put a coefficient of 2 in there. And you'll notice that since we started on the y-axis, uh, there was no shift to the left or right. The, sh the, the convenience of using sine is that no shifting was necessary. So we just end up with a 2x right here. And this gives us the simplest, least complicated trigonometric function that gives us this graph, y equals 2 plus 3 sine of 2x. Let's consider another example. Uh, looking at this trigonometric graph, the first thing I want to identify is the midline. Uh, the middle of the graph is going to be right here. It's again going to be at y equals 2. Does this look like sine or cosine? Well, it starts on the midline. So if you start on the midline with respect to the y-axis, that's going to be a sine, right? But this time we're decreasing. So this one is going to be a sine with a reflection, with a reflection on it. So our basic model we're working with here is again going to be sine. So we get y equals k plus a sine of b times x minus h, like so. That's what we're looking for. Um, the shift we've already identified because that's the location of the midline. So we get y equals 2 plus. Let's try to find the amplitude. The amplitude is how big these bumps are, right? So how far above the midline do we go? This one goes all the way up to 7. The midline at, the midline's at 2, so the amplitude is going to be 5. They're different, 7 minus 2. But because it's been reflected, we need to have a negative sign incorporated in there. So in fact, we have a we have y equals 2 minus 7, not 7, 
five, the difference between the top and the midline. So seven minus two is five times sine. So now we have to adjust for any uh, any period changes or shifting. The advantage that's of looking at the y-axis is since we started on the y-axis, there's no shifting going on here. So we just need to figure out the period change. We see that one period is displayed on the screen starting at zero and ending at two pi thirds. This is one cycle. So we get that the period is gonna equal two pi thirds, which means B is gonna equal two pi divided by two pi thirds, which to make life a little bit easier, I'm gonna times top and bottom by three. So these threes cancel out, the two pi's are gonna cancel out, and the end you just end up with a three, like so. And so then finishing up our equation here, we get Y equals two minus five sine of three X. And this then gives us the correct equation for this sine wave. Again, there's more than one equation you could use, but this is gonna be the simplest one. We wanna avoid uh, horizontal shifts as much as possible. Let's consider one last example here. Now, when I look at this one, uh, well, the midline's a little bit harder to see. It's tempting to say it's the x-axis. Is it the x-axis? Well, if you look at the very bottom of the graph, with respect to the um, with respect to the y-axis, it, it does actually start on the y-axis here. So this already tells me that, oh, the graph, I could probably get away with a, so a cosine there. The lowest value is negative five. The largest value is here at three. So what's the midpoint? Negative five plus three is a negative two. Divide that by two is negative one. So the midline is going to be at negative one. Um, it might, it kind of looked like it could be the x-axis, but the correct midline is going to be here at negative one like so. All right. So our basic function we're looking for is y equals k plus a times cosine of b times x minus h. We're using a cosine model uh, for this one right here. So can we identify the shift? The shift is where the midline is located at. So we end up with y is equal to negative one. Now, is this cosine reflected? The standard cosine, it starts off at one, it comes down, it goes up, something like this. So ours is in fact reflected. Notice how we start off by increasing, not decreasing. So we're gonna put a negative sign right here. What's the amplitude? Well, the amplitude is how far above the midline are we? So if the midline's at negative one, it goes all the way up to three. The difference there, three minus negative one is four. The amplitude is gonna be a four which is what we need to put here. So we have y equals negative one minus four times cosine of, we need to identify a period, which we have exactly one period listed. We can go from zero to six right here. The period is six, which if the period is six, that means B is equal to two pi over six. Uh, two goes into six three times, so we end up with pi thirds as our coefficient B. And so then we end up putting that in there. So we're gonna get pi thirds x. And this then gives us the simplest equation for our cosine wave right here. And again, we've made all of our decisions to avoid the phase shift as much as possible. We don't like horizontal shifts because it definitely complicates things. So if at all possible, if the y axis coincides with a intersection of the midline or a maximum or a minimum of the graph, then you don't have to do a phase shift and life becomes so much easier for us. Uh, so that then ends lecture 11, which is going to conclude our discussion of transforming sine and cosine. In lecture 12, we're going to learn or we're going to continue the transformations we've learned in the last couple of lectures, but apply them to the other trigonometric functions, tangent, cotangent, secant, and cosecant as well. So I hope you'll stay tuned for those. Um, if you've learned things in these videos, please give it a like. If you'd like to see more videos like this in the future, subscribe to the channel. And as always, if you have any questions, feel free to post them in the comments of this video or any of the videos you watch, and I'll be glad to answer them at my soonest capability.